to start with a review of what uh, what we've done the last week. So we've been trying to uh, figure out how to how to describe a theory of strings rather than a theory of particles. So uh, our and my purpose is to try to figure out how to generalize the notion of uh, scattering amplitudes of amplitudes of particles to scattering amplitudes of strings. So try to build at least perturbatively a quantum theory of strings. Now, the main difference between a, a string and a particle is that the, part, the, that the particle is a point-like object which has almost no degrees of freedom besides the center of mass motion, while a string has a lot of degrees of freedom. So a particle uh, might be represented by you know, a point moving in space-time. Perhaps it can have a, some extra degree of freedom, like a spin. But a string is something more complicated. So a string would have a center of mass, degree of freedom, which behave like the position of a particle. But then you have the other degrees of freedom that has to do with the oscillations of the string. And so classically, a string moving in space time would be like a, a fluctuating blob. It moves along. Quantum mechanically, uh, these oscillations are quantized. So like an harmonic oscillator, you get a bunch of states, excitation states for this string. Uh, in a sense, I mean, it's not the difference from what you have when you look at the nucleus, say. Now, if you look at the nucleus of an atom, there is a ground state, there are a bunch of excited states. Uh, and when you study the, I don't know, the scattering of some nucleus, it may be that you send your nucleus in, not excited, and it comes out excited. But uh, so in a theory of, in a theory of strings, uh, so if you, if you look at energies which are, uh, right, so comparable to the to the ones to the excitation energy of the string. So these strings could come out, come in in the ground states, they could come out excited in various ways. Now each, roughly speaking, you can imagine each excitation, each of these excitation states of the string as its own particle. Meaning each of these excited st states of the strings behave more or less like a particle. If you leave them by themselves, they just maintain their identity. When they scatter, the string can be excited or, or unexcited, which behaves like some changes in, in the particles that are coming in or coming out. Now, this means that essentially every excitation state of the string will give rise at low energy to some field. So each, is, each of these excitation states of the string correspond to a single particle state of your, of your string theory. And then from these particle states, you build fields so that describe excitations with many particles or many strings. So, so typically, you have a bunch of fields, each corresponding to one of the excited states of the string. Now, some of these excited states can carry space time indices, might have non-trivial transformations under rotations. This, and correspondingly, these fields will carry space-time indices. So they might behave like vector bosons or, I don't know, gravitons or whatever. Now, by, by gauge fixing, by, by adding some extra degrees of freedom and then gauge fixing them, we managed to, in the first lecture, to transform the equations of motions of a, of a string into form which is very convenient, meaning that the states of the string end up being described as uh, excited states of a bunch of free scalars which live on the string worship. So we have some uh, Hilbert space of uh, some free scalars. And inside this Hilbert space, there is a bunch of states which correspond to the physical states of the string. Inside the space of physical states, there are parallel states that are null, 
which decouples from every calculation. So the final answer is that the single particle Hilbert space for the string ends up being discarded as some sort of a quotient. Now, this, we described this quotient a bit by hand uh, in a couple of lectures ago. These are states that are annihilated by some modes of the stress tensor. And these were states that are generated by some modes of the stress tensor. In the next lecture, we'll do things a bit better with PRC quantization. So this, this will end up being something like the, the quotient between a Q closed states and Q exact states. So <clears throat> sorry, actually let me Or to stress out the actual Hilbert space of the strings of the string theory. Is the Fox space built out of that one particle Hilbert space? Now, the space of states of string theory includes the vacuum, states with one string propagating, states with two strings propagating, at least perturbatively. So it's important to be careful and not to confuse the, the space of states of, the, of your free scalar theory, which is an auxiliary tool to build the one particle Hilbert space of the string theory, and the, space, and the Hilbert space of string theory itself. The Hilbert space of string theory is much bigger. So the space H free scalars is also a Fox space. The Fox space of a two dimensional quantum field theory. And then, out of this, we build a one particle states and we build the Fox space of string theory, which is a Fox space of a quantum field theory in, in your Taga space, say in 26 dimensions, with infinitely many fields. Much bigger. Uh, okay, but most of the time we'll just think about the uh, one particle Hilbert space. After all, the sort of question we're trying to answer is, what happens if I take a bunch of one particle states of my strings coming from the past and have them scatter? into some other states. So what we want to compute is sort of perturbative amplitude, the scattering amplitude. And the nice feature of string theory is that the interactions happen very naturally. You don't need to put them in by hand. But all you need to do is to sort of consider all possible ways to smoothly interpolate between them, between these histories, the incoming history and the outgoing history by some primal surface, by some surface, two-dimensional worksheet with a bunch of tubes going to the future and a bunch of tubes coming from the past. So we want to compute 
is amplitude, which. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was trying to make a loop diagram. So um, I'm not sure this is very, I'm not very good at drawing two dimensional surfaces. This is supposed to be a donut, donut with a bunch of tubes. Is this a. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. I think I'm doing things even worse like that. Uh, yeah, but uh, probably made it worse, but. <laughs> Mm -hmm. we will connect the strings like smoothly. Yes. Uh, why is that the interaction between two things? Is it meant to, mm -hmm. well, natural things too, right? So like, it's kind of just, it's just the meaning of, it's that type of interaction. It's a choice. So you could try to put by hand other interactions. It will probably not work. Uh, but uh, it, if it works, it will, uh, it's going to give you something that is more singular at high energy than string theory. So. Typically, if you have a quantum field theory, you try to do a quantum field theory of gravity, say. What you've right done is not normalizable. It's going to have some thickness and some sufficient high energy. So whenever you do something that mimics gravity, sorry, that mimics quantum field theory, you're likely going to have trouble. So, so somehow, I consider this process, and I see some up over all possible ways of connecting that, right? I mean, yes. it's just an example of genus one. But finally, yeah, that's right. So I'll head to sum over the genus. Okay which is like the loop expansion of quantum field theory. So this is a, say, one loop. Because there is one hole. Yes? Indeed, well, so I would guess they would look like the strings coming in, becoming very tiny, and then something happening to them. Uh, I mean, because it depends on how, you know, it depends on what you want to do. For example, if what you're adding is local in space time, then, right, so you have to pass your strings becoming, we had to go all to the same point and then coming out of that point. So it looks like that. Uh, and then when you have, you know, several of these points that come and collide, you'll get the singularities of quantum field theory. Here, there are no special points. OK. So So right, roughly, if you forget for a moment that we have to introduce Gauss and do things properly, the Hilbert space of uh, or the free scalar is built from a ground state uh, of specific center of mass momentum. I mean, so really a family of an infinite family of possible states where only the center of mass momentum is excited and no fluctuations modes of the string. Uh, and then the Fox space built out of them by exciting the string. No. Wait, that's that. There's a whole Fox space built from the from this basic momentum mode out of by using the oscillators. This index mu Greek indices indicate indices in space time. Uh, so there is Lorentz symmetry 
acting on these indices. And inside this rescaler space, there are some physical states. For example, here, yeah, these guys with p square equal to 2. These guys are not in the string. These guys uh, up to some polarization. So the physical spectrum of the string end up including a tachyon. So these states will be packaged together, can be packaged together as a single, or at least can be interpreted as a single particle state for one field, the tachyon field. Which mass, with mass minus two. These states can be collected together in the single particle states of a spin two field, massless, a massless two form, and a massless scalar, the Dillerton. And then all the other fields, all the other states, give rise to states, to massive states. So an infinite tower of massive states. And uh, among some among these physical states, there are some which are null. So it turns out that all the states such that epsilon mu nu is p mu u nu plus u mu sorry, u mu p mu are null. which from the point of view of the fields for which these are single particle states, uh, it means that these fields have a rich symmetry. Some of the single particle states of these fields decouple from the theory. And they are the states where Sorry? So you are just some, num some, some vectors, whatever vectors you want. So every time you can write an a, a polarization in this form, this is a null state. Now, if, in going from here to here, I took the symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of the, of the indices. So this, this spin true field accounts for the symmetrized one particle states. And this true form accounts for the anti-symmetrized. It's convenient, actually, symmetrized and traceless. Uh, See, as we have a Lorentz symmetry acting on these states, it's convenient to decompose them in Lorentz, irreducible Lorentz, in the reducible representations of the Lorentz group. So this gauge symmetry is the gauge symmetry of a graviton. And this gauge symmetry is the gauge symmetry of, a, of some sort of weird generalization of a, of a gauge field. And so this is the first uh, manifestation of the fact that string theory always has a graviton. Uh, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Well, uh, yes, that's right. So the on the worksheet we had a big gauge symmetry, 
I mean, uh, which had to do with the, the fact that we had to introduce a metric to make the action in a way that was quant quantizable, that was the action of thrift scalars. And then we had to get rid of the uh, diffeomorphisms and also wild transformations. So this big gauge freedom up here turns out into a bunch of gauge freedoms for all the uh, states in your, I mean, it tells you that the, the Hilbert space or what the or one particle state has a sort of form where you are to the couple of null states. And right, so that, that manifests itself into gauge freedoms at the level of the, of the, of the fields that come out of the strain. Um, actually, for the massive fields, uh, this sort of freedom, these null states, see, the point is, for the massive fields, the null states come into full massive representation of the Poincare group. Just throw them, throw them away, and you're left with some other massive representation of the Lorentz group. But for massless states, things are a little bit more subtle, and uh, the null states give, so, give, give rise to a, to a gauge freedom, meaning that if you, there is no way to throw them away uh, by hand and leave everything Lorentz invariant. If you want to get rid of them, you need to do, really do a proper gauge fixing. Uh, and actually, amusingly, when you gauge fix things up here properly by using the ghosts, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you actually automatically get the ghosts that you need to gauge fix things downstairs in space time. So once you but this is for tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll do the gauge fixing with all the bells and whistles. Um, for now, let's just uh, focus on the review. So, So how did, the, how did this sort of structure come about in the first lecture? So we started with some very basic uh, proposal for the action for, the, for these strings, what's called the Namugoto action, where uh, but roughly that. where the action was essentially the area of this surface. Now, quantizing that was too complicated because it's a nonlinear expression. But uh, there is a better option, which is to use the Polyakov action, which is an action which classically reduces to the area action, but is reasonably straightforward to quantize. So the Polyakov action. Uh, is natural for a bunch of scalar fields which describe the position of your surface in space-time. So you can imagine them as maps from the surface sigma Space time. And as an auxiliary degrees of freedom, which are a metric on the Riemann surface. These are the degrees of freedom. The action is essentially the simplest action you can write for these degrees of freedom. 
uh, for the scalar fields in the presence of a metric. which is this. I'm raising a lower indices with the uh, implicitly with the Lorentz matrix. Okay. Now this, this action has a lot of nice symmetries. First of all, it's written in such a way that it is invariant under coordinate transformations. So it has a symmetry which are the thermophysms. They, they're generated by some vector fields on your surface. Uh, and they transform your fields by the thermophysms. And your metric also by the thermophysms. Okay. Notice here I've lowered some indices using the metric. Uh, so the metric on the surface. Now, this is, is sort of expected. What's unexpected is that this theory also has a wild symmetry. And this is very special of two dimensional worksheets. And it's essentially the reason for which you, you can do string theory, but we don't know how to do membrane theory, say. The wild symmetry is very simple, it just rescales the metric. So because of the symmetries, it means that there, there is a lot of redundance. If I try to do my path integral, this is a path integral over the fields. And the metric. I'm going to get a big infinity because of this redundance. So what we actually want to do is somehow divide out by the, the thermophysms and wild transformations. So this is a sort of formal statement, uh, but uh, that is to gauge fix this, but in take this formal part integral and thing, I think you get something that's actually meaningful. Now, here you encounter a possible problem. These are classical symmetries, your symmetries of your action. They may or not be symmetries of your measure. Now, uh, as I was mentioning, usually when you have troubles with a quantum measure, the troubles can jump all over the place. It's up to you to decide how to regularize it. If you make different choices of how to regularize it, you might find problems in different uh, locations. Now, typically, when you have a metric on your worksheet, there is a very convenient way to regularize, which is to sort of put the cutoff, throwing away all the modes that fluctuate with the wavelength uh, shorter than some fixed distance on the worksheet. Now, this definition implicitly uses the, the distance on the worksheet, so it uses the metric. So there is nice regularization uh, 
is cut off based on distance. Now, because the definition of the distance is deformorphism variant, this cutoff leaves deformorphism variants reserved. Because we haven't made any strange choice treating some scalars different from some other scalars, is automatically Lorentz invariant. But because we use the metric, you can image trans troubles with my wild transformations. So because of that, it's actually natural to first fix, gauge fix the diffeomorphisms and see what happens. Now, yes, on, on Friday, we, we studied BRST quantization. So we learned how to uh, gauge fix symmetries with, with ghost and BRST symmetry. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you do that for the diffeomorphism, uh, so you remember, you have to introduce some ghosts uh, for the symmetries, some ghosts for your gauge fixing conditions. Uh, now, which sort of gauge, fix, gauge fixing condition can we use to gauge fix the deformorphisms? Now, there is a nice theorem. Should I have a free blackboard here? So the theorem is that up to the thermophysms, every metric on a surface can be put to this form locally. Uh, And you can go, you can join the patches by holomorphic transformations. The, the, uh, the uh, holomorphic coordinate transformation changes your your metric in a very nice way. So it lives in, in particular it lives in this in this nice form. It just rescales your choice of uh, sh shifts your scale of the choice of uh, wild factor. So pretty much it means that for gauge fixing, all I want to do is to set H Z Z to zero and H C bar Z bar to zero. Now, you could complain that this doesn't quite fix all the formophisms, because after all, I can still do these sort of transformations that leave the metric in that form. But although these transformations are always available locally to glue patches together, uh, it's actually pretty rare to have a globally defined holomorphic coordinate tra transformation on your surface. If they exist, there is just a handful of them, and you can just deal by them with them by hand. But not really by hand. Didn't deal with them properly in the context of the BRST quantization. And we learned how to do that. So, so what does that mean? It pretty much means that I want to insert 
formally something like this. And um, and then I'm going to have to add something involving the ghosts. Uh, this gauge fixing. Again, I'm not going to go in details today. The details will work there. We'll regard the details tomorrow. But roughly, you get a ghost for every gauge fixing condition. A big ghost for gauge fixing condition. And a C ghost for every diffeomorphism. <laughs> So after you do that, you can pretty much forget about the diffeomorphisms. You're only left with the problem of dealing with this wild symmetry. Uh, of course, now there are also ghosts. But integral. Okay. Okay. So now, one is ready to, to figure out what's going to happen to the wild symmetry. So the question is, is this but integral now going to be wild invariant? Now, it's actually nice that, as I remarked, the, the wild factor completely drops out of the action for the scalars. It actually drops out also from the action from the ghosts. So essentially, that means that the procedure of gauge fixing, uh, the diffeomorphism, has not introduced any violations of wild symmetry. Or at least if there are any violations, they must be hidden in the part integral for the ghosts themselves. Okay. So, uh, so the question that's left is, is the product of this and this while invariant? So from the from the scalar fields, it's just a calculation. You put it here, you get something like the z the z bar of the axis. Here you can get get h g z bar with upper indices, which is the inverse of h g z bar with lower indices, and the determinant of the matrix is again h g z bar. So this cancels out against this. For the ghosts, is a calculation. We have not computed the ghost action yet, so we'll see it tomorrow. Now, it turns out that the violation of uh, wild symmetry can be captured just by one number, uh, meaning that this, this whole action is going to transform. Uh, so if you do a, a wild transformation, this whole action transforms by uh, some functional. of your while. Uh, so if you do a while transform, sorry. I want to write it correctly, sorry. So if you do while trans a while transformation with parameter epsilon, your measure transforms in a very specific way. Um, with a specific number in front. And so the form of the transformation is always the same, essentially, no matter what is your two-dimensional field theory, while invariant, classically while invariant field theory. The number depends on your theory. Mm -hmm. If uh, H G Z bar drops out, what changes do you do to model transformation? The measure. 
So HGC bar is still important to, this, to define the distance. So to define your cutoff. And depending on how much time we have, I can be quite, quite explicit about that. So the point is that this number, which is called central charge, this is some contribution from the excess and some contribution from the ghosts. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, so this is something that you pick in front of the measure. So this f of epsilon is some function of epsilon. Uh, I could be more specific, uh, but I, I have to remember it by heart. Uh, I didn't write it down, unfortunately. It's something like del del bar epsilon plus, uh, what was it? Uh, roughly plus epsilon, root of h epsilon or something like that. Roughly, okay. You can always compute it as an exercise. Um, so the point is that each of the scalar fields contributes one to this number. The ghost's contribution will compute tomorrow and is minus 26. So the result is that if and only if you have 26 scalar fields, then the total C is zero. So your measure is well invariant, your action is well invariant, and pretty much you get rid of your HDZ bar right away. Because after all, the wild transformation will only act on HDZ bar and just rescale it. So you can just use them to get rid of it. OK, in principle, you could do it with all the bells and whistles, you know, really add a ghost for the wild transformation, for the wild symmetry, gauge fix it, but in the end, you just get nothing. So uh, there's no point doing it. Okay, so how do we how do we learn what what is the at least how do we detect that there is a violation of wild symmetry, say in the theory of a free scalar or the theory of the ghosts? And how do we quantify that that, that violation? Now um, a good way to do it is by looking at the properties of the stress tensor. See Classically, the stress tensor just, by definition, captures the changes in your action under a change of the metric. You can say the stress tensor for the, for the scalar fields. Oh, maybe I should put it up here. Uh, quantum mechanically, there is a stress tensor operator, which is roughly doing the same thing, meaning that uh, if you have a coercion function of a bunch of operators, in the presence of a specific metric, then the insertion of the stress tensor should, give it, should be the same as the variation of your correlation function with respect of a variation of the metric. Uh, up possibly to some contact terms.
which have to do with the fact that the definition, the very definition of your operator might actually depend on the definition on your choice of metric. So this is a classical this is a quantum mechanical. Okay. Now uh, as a as a consequence of the thermophism invariance, the stress tensor is, is conserved, which classically means Something like that. Quantum mechanically means that if you insert your the divergence of the if you take the divergence of the insertion of the stress tensor, you get zero up to contact terms. Which means that the divergence, the divergence stress tensor inserted in your correlation function gives you essentially zero up to some contributions at the, which appear only if your uh, stress tensor was really colliding with some of the operators, in which case it gives you the, the action of this, uh, gives you a translation of the operator, the action of the diffeomorphism over your operator. And for a while, classically, the if, if a wide symmetry is a classical symmetry, you expect the stress, the trace of the stress tensor to be zero. Quantum mechanically, if a wide symmetry is a is a symmetry of your theory, you expect again the trace of the stress tensor to be zero up to contact terms. which come about because the definition of your operator might not be wide invariant. Typically, if you have an operator, uh, a classical operator, when you try to define a quantum operator, uh, so sorry, if you want a classical expression, you try to define a quantum operator, uh, there might be some divergences, there might be some regularization like point splitting. Do, and this regularization usually implicitly uses the metric. So the definition of your operator might change under a wild transformation. Okay. Now, the sort of contact, te contact terms, the sort of delta functions that only appear when your operator is sitting on, some, on top of something else, are typically, uh, you know, they're, they're well defined up to a lot of freedom in redefining your operators. Uh, but, but sometimes you can make some regular statements about them. Uh, Clearly, you cannot really detect them if your operators are just sitting at different points. But you can detect them if you say, consider uh, deforming your action by the integral of some operator over your whole uh, space, because then this integral is going to pick up the delta function.
So let's see if we can see some manifestation of this thing. So let's see if you can really see that, say, the, stress, the trace of the stress tensor is not going to be truly zero in a correlation function if your metric is not flat or something like that. Um, so and let's do it in the free scalar theory, which is rather simple to understand. So as you remember, we gave a definition of the stress tensor. Just call it S because remember last in the second lecture, I think we were working on the cylinder. We studied the free scalar on the cylinder. And we learned how to compute correlation functions and uh, various operators. Okay. So we give this definition. Now, there is a lot of lot going on implicitly under this definition. See, we use this to cancel the singularity. This is implicitly assuming that we were working with a flat metric on the cylinder. So, uh, you can imagine that if you start changing the metric by wild transformation, you might get different regularizations and maybe get into some trouble. But um, let's try to do something rigorous. So for example, let's compute a two-point function of the, of the stress tensor. on the cylinder. So I set my space time, I put a vacuum in the past and in the future. I pick two points S and S prime and put a stress tensor at each of them. Okay. I can do this computation directly from the definition or I can do it by using the Loret the the Virasoro algebra, which we also computed in the previous lecture. Together with the fact that Positive modes kill uh, the vacuum. Okay. So I can just plug in the the definition of the the, the Fourier expansion of the stress tensor. Okay. You can plug it here. A lot of terms will just drop out because the positive L's kill this and negative L's kill that. In the terms that don't, in the terms that don't drop out immediately, I can use the commutation relation to bring, say, a negative guy from here to here, and then it kills the other side. So all that you're left with are the contributions from the commutator. More precisely, only the commutators which give me something which don't kill everything. Doesn't kill everything. Um, sorry, actually I should just put this, sorry. Okay, so what you actually get it's something like contributions from the constant part only. All these else ultimately, sorry, 
kill the vacuum. Okay, so what I thought was correct, sorry. Uh, okay. Two. Pick your definition. That's why I put these deltas. Pick your definition of operators. As long as the operator make, as long as the definition makes sense, then these equalities are two. If you use a different definition, wait, sorry, of the operators, you get slightly different variations there. Now you can, can ask, what about the definition of the stress tensor? Perhaps this is what you were asking. Sorry, you're right. Sorry, yes, yes, that's correct. So, what are we doing here? Um, see, by define by regularizing the stress tensor, what you're really doing is essentially defining the measure of my path integral implicitly. At least, for, it's there is an implicit definition of how the measure is going to change when I change the metric. If you want to define the stress tensor in flat space, then uh, if I want to know what is the stress tensor in some other metric. Oh, if I want to do a change in the metric, uh, I can insert this stress tensor and see what happens. Um, sorry, I'm not saying it very well. Let me say it better. So suppose you regularize your stress tensor in different ways. What's the result? So all the regularization will differ by adding some C number to your stress tensor, something that is not an operator, something that is the number. So if you insert the stress tensor with different regularizations inside these correlation functions, what's, what's going give to give to you is an extra term. So if I, if I, change, if I change the regularization, I'm going to change the answer by a multiple of the correlation function of these operators. So you can sort of try to absorb it in a redefinition of your measure of integration. So if you redefine your measure by a scalar, by, by a number, that would exactly have this effect. Every correlation function will be multiplied by that number. So, um, so, right, so if you pick two different definitions of your stress tensor, uh, they can be related by, so they're related by a, a finite shift, a well-defined shift, which can be absorbed into a, a well-defined rescaling of your measure of your correlation function. And notice usually when you correlation functions, you actually divide by the correlation function of nothing. So typically the sort of factor will actually mostly drop out, but we don't want to do that because we actually interest, exactly interested in how the, uh, Correlation function depends on the metric. So we want our nothing to, to be, say, one, no matter, to, to, to remain the same when I do a wild transformation. So. Yes. Uh, I mean, just just plug the definition. <laughs> there is nothing. At this point, there is. I don't want to say anything deep, 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 different than that. It's just an observation that if you, but if you want, I can put the minus one here. Doesn't that, that doesn't nothing changes in the uh, analysis. Um, sorry. So let me try to say it better. So suppose. Suppose that this expression with other regularization made sense. Okay, it doesn't quite, but suppose it made sense. And it corresponded to some well-defined measure. Then these changes in the stress tensor just gives you an overall rescaling of the measure. You have absorbed an overall rescaling of the measure. Um, now, that measure actually didn't make sense. It, it was some infinity. It had to be regularized. And similarly, this didn't make 
So I'm claiming that this, the shift, the rescaling of the measure corresponds to the shift of the stress tensor uh, is exactly what regularizes the measure and regularizes the stress tensor. Um, but okay, so let let me let me just time is short. So let me just say when I pick the regularization of the stress tensor, I picked implicitly a regularization of my measure. Okay. So so now let me compute this two point function. So you're going to get something like this. Uh, I think, uh, check me on that. But so the final answer is supposed to be the constant so what I wanted to get to was just the statement that if there was no central charge the two-point function of the stress tensors would be very mild it would be just some constant no singularities but because there is a central charge then you get a singularity in the two-point function of the stress tensors. Now, why, why should this worry me? Well, suppose I'm trying to check conservation, the diffeomorphism invariance, OK? Diffeomorphism invariance is the statement that del bar, del s bar TSS plus del s TSS bar is 0. OK? And uh, if, I, if I try to do it here, so I try to do an inside this correlation function, See the that is bar acting on this almost gives me zero, right? It gives zero everywhere except when S and S prime coincide. So roughly uh, right here, the S of this. correlation function gives you something proportional to the third derivative of a delta function. See, I'm using essentially the fact that delta bar of uh, 1 over s minus s prime it's just del, the delta function. Now here I have a div divergence of order four, so I can get it from here by doing three derivatives. So I do now So now this doesn't look very good because inside this sort of water identity for diffeomorphisms, we are, we are supposed to just get translations, the effect of the diffeomorphisms on my stress tensor. And, I it's a, and we want our definition of the measure and of correlation function to be invariant under diffeomorphisms. 
So to compensate for this, I need to also define my T of SS bar in such a way that it can cancel this. Luckily, this is a derivative of type of S. So it's actually uh, rather straightforward. Okay. So whatever is my definition of the measure, if I want to do things in a way that is diffeomorphism invariant, I'll have my T of S's bar will have some contact terms with my first tensor. Now, all of this was done in a flat metric. Now, suppose I, I want to change my, uh, but I can use this to compute the, the expectation value of TSS bar in the presence of a metric which is infinitesimally close to being flat. So if I do the calculation in the presence of a metric, which is uh, infinitesimally close to the flat metric, then I'm going to get Something like that. So you see, um, this is a, a way to understand why why people say that this central charge which appears here in the Virasov algebra is related to the lack of wild symmetry of your theory. Mm -hmm. When you write T S S bar, would you T S bar S bar, right? No, no, S S bar. So I, uh, sorry, I remember that if I want to change the, met the S bar, S bar component of the metric, I need to add SS because we raise indices with the. Sure, but, but in the flat metric, TS S bar is zero, right? Because of the tracer condition. Classically. Oh, I see. So this is showing you that if you want to do your things in a quantum theory, in a way that is invariant, where things are invariant under diffeomorphisms, and you have a, a central charge in your wall, in your there's a algebra, you are going to get in trouble with wild symmetry. Because the one point function of your trace of the first tensor will actually be non zero if, you're, if there is a non trivial metric on your manifold. Uh, this is only infinitesimal. The, 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 the full statement is that TSS bar equal, is proportional to the central charge times the Ricci scalar. So this is the full statement. It's called the wild anomaly. So generally quantum field theories, which are uh, classically wild invariant, you get this sort of quantum expressions where the stress of the stress tensor is equal to some complicated uh, well, some polynomial in the curvature. In should have mentioned this is the statement. Uh, Negative dimension is more complicated and you get more numbers. Okay, sorry, I went wildly over time. Well, I mean, I, I this was a sort of a very roundabout way to learn about while 
problems with TSS bar, starting with things we know about TSS. TSS is fine. TSS is fine. It's fine. Uh, well, fine. Kind of fine. Uh, no, TSS is fine. Uh, Yes. Yes, so if you want, presumably if we did this in point splitting, we would have ended up with the same result. So if you've done the, the, the two point function of del x, well, sorry, it's tough to say, right? So I mean, the classical expression of TSS bar is just, uh, Zero, but it's zero if you use the equations of motion. Um, so this this list open the possibility that if you do the calculation in point splitting and then you try to, uh, to I mean, regularizing properly in the presence of a metric, you will actually get something which is not zero, because after all, the equation of motion themselves are valid up to uh, uh, Corrections, but I did not do the calculation, so actually this statement might be not, not correct. Uh, I invite you to check if you can actually verify this. Uh, in a sense, right, the, the point is you need to pick a regularization of your TSS bar that no matter what preserves the word identity. So you pick your normalization of TSS, you pick your normalization of TSS bar, however you want, as long as this is true. And then it should be true that if you do it in, with a generic metric, you end up with something on zero. Uh, 